please welcome our own hometown hero, Theo Corborn. I know there are some people old enough in the room today, I am sure, who remember Paul Harvey. Ah, okay, the blue hairs. A radio newscaster who captured the nation each noon with what he called the rest of the story. Well, to get right to the point, I am going to share with you today some information about the hazards posed by air pollution to human health from natural gas operations that to date have received very little attention. But before I start, keep in mind that no federal government baseline air quality monitoring was done prior to the rapid development of natural gas wells in Western Colorado. And no systematic air quality monitoring has been done throughout the expansion. There are five sources of airborne chemicals that you can expect to be exposed to if you happen to live where an energy company decides it's going to drill for gas. The extent and range of exposure can vary from pad to pad and from source to source. And of course, a tremendous amount of exposure is controlled by weather conditions. These sources are as follows. When raw natural gas comes to the surface, it releases along with the methane large volumes of native gases that would ordinarily stay underground. Combustion sources include trucks and other vehicles and stationary equipment like compressors that burn fossil fuels and produce exhaust, nitrogen oxide, and particulate matter that also have a secondary effect of producing ozone or smog as they rise into the atmosphere. There is the deliberate injection of volatile chemicals into wells to facilitate drilling and fracking. And then there are chemicals used for the cleaning and maintenance of equipment on pads and off-pad gas delivery structures and equipment that has been totally neglected. And then there are the chemicals that become airborne from open evaporation pits that I will not have time to cover today in any way, for which there is very little information. So I'll start first with a group of native volatile chemicals that come to the surface in the raw natural gas as it escapes from the ground. These are volatile and semi-volatile chemicals that under normal conditions would never come to the surface. Think of them as aliens from inner space. If you find yourself living in a gas patch, you will not be able to escape exposure to them. They have been given little or no attention by industry, the public health agencies, and the medical community. Yet some of them are extremely toxic. However, the US EPA does acknowledge them. When energy companies determine how much methane they are releasing from the ground in order to determine their impact on climate change, the EPA gives the companies a default of as much as 17.9% or more of the raw gas as non-methane hydrocarbons. In other words, EPA admits the presence of this group of volatiles that are not greenhouse gases, the alien chemicals that are sneaking into our biosphere in the raw gas. In one US EPA Greenhouse Gas Committee report, the authors believe that this percentage is significantly underestimated. Looking at what this means in terms of what is already taking place in our watershed, according to the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, there is a well up near McClure Pass that last year produced 418, 656 MCF, and MCF stands for 1,000 cubic feet of raw gas, most of which is methane, and 17.9% of that would be about 75,000 MCF per year from one well on this particular pad. There are more wells on that pad now. Or 205,000 cubic feet per day from that well. Now, when Calvin Tillman 
took the air pollution problem in his hometown into his own hands and hired a company to sample the air in DISH, the truth about air pollution began to surface. Soon, other individuals and assorted grassroots groups across the country were lear learning how to grab air in canisters where natural gas action was taking place. And gradually, the alien hitchhikers began to get some attention. Over the years, EPA has established several standard air quality testing protocols for detecting them in the environment. As a matter of fact, some of the chemicals can be detected by several different assays recommended by EPA. And among them, of course, are the benzene, toluene, ethyl benzene, and xylene, the famous BTEXs. But there are many more. Here we provide just a partial list of the chemicals detected in bucket-style air samples taken near a gas operation. Some of these chemicals have been associated with as many as 11 of the health effects listed on the right. For many of these chemicals, there are no government safety standards to identify at what level exposure leads to harm. And for those chemicals where a safety standard may have been established, the standard was based on an eight hour workday, five days a week for a 70 kilogram fully grown man. Studies did not take into consideration neighbors who could be exposed around the clock or the workers who work 12 hours or more at a time per shift. They did not also take into consideration the concept that repeated interrupted low level exposure can lead faster to sensitization to chemicals compared with just constant low level exposure. <clears throat> None of those standards took into consideration effects on the endocrine system or the consequences of prenatal exposure. We were surprised to find a large percent interfere with the endocrine system, which operates at extremely low concentrations. Endocrine disrupting chemicals have been shown to have devastating impacts on lab animals, wildlife, and even humans at concentrations as low as parts per billion and parts per trillion. The chemicals found in these bucket samples also cause severe irreversible damage to the brain, the immune system, and can lead to chronic heart and kidney disorders that to clinicians could easily be written off as early aging or the result of a wild lifestyle of smoking and drinking. How could a doctor possibly link these problems to air pollution? That highlighted chemical, chemical over on the right, is methylene chloride. That is a man-made chemical used as a solvent. And I will be getting back to methylene chloride later. It is now clear that as the drill bit hits the play where the gas is trapped, the raw gas begins to escape at the wellhead, bringing along the aliens. Capturing the raw gas during drilling is very difficult. Consequently, gas wells are allowed to vent for months before they become attached to a delivery system, allowing for massive amounts of the native gases to escape. And from then on, wherever there is fugitive raw gas around operations, the aliens will be there too. Now here we have a close-up of a pad and where there can be leaks. Top left, these busy looking pipes are the Christmas trees where the raw gas comes to the surface. Each has a solar panel that records the temperature and when it gets down near freezing, it triggers the release of methanol, wood alcohol, to mix in with the gas that comes from the ground wet in order to keep it from freezing and cause pipes to burst. These are the heater treaters where part of the unwanted gases, oils and water are stripped from the gas. See the air vents for when the pressure builds up and they can burn off. And then the tank storage area, that large tank in the front, holds the oily, greasy wets that will be hauled off to be processed and sold. The small tanks to the back are holding recovered water. Some of the aliens hitch rides in the condensates and the water. They are released every time a water truck hooks up to unload recovered fluids. From holding tanks on pads, 
and again at the other end where the truck unloads the fluids into open evaporation pits, perhaps as far as 100 miles into Utah from here, or to a reinjection site. Here you can see a water truck as the driver was draining produced water into the truck from the storage tank to the right. Throughout the 47 minutes it took to unload the water into the truck, volatile compounds were blowing off into the air. In this case, you can see a cloud of paraffin, maybe some of that was paraffin that you were seeing, being blown off to the left by a wind gust. Raw gas in the Peon Spacing comes up with a lot of paraffin in it. Now, in this case, paraffin is serving as an indicator that other fugitive gases are present. When the driver first opened the valve to release the water, the wind was not blowing, and a cloud of paraffin covered the truck and the entire view. That driver did not wear a respirator. And throughout the life of all pads, which could be decades, where condensate and water are stored in tanks, this auxiliary service will have to continue. Now, the second source of airborne chemicals we've heard about already is the exhaust from the combustion of natural gas, gasoline, diesel, and assorted petroleum products to maintain mobile and stationary equipment operations. As the land becomes industrialized, where natural gas activity starts to take place, there will be more and more large SUVs, heavy pickup trucks, flat bucket haulers, dump trucks, huge cabs pulling all kinds of tanks and equipment. You've seen them all here. They will all be contributing to the exhaust stream that is released into large volumes, by in large volumes, 24-7 throughout both drilling and fracking operations. There will be water tank trucks lined up in turn to load water here from the Colorado River. And there will be more of them lined up waiting to unload on the pad, and in between, we get to see them on the road. And also on the pad, there will be standby fuel tankers ready in line, idling their motors so that there is never a loss in fuel to maintain pressure while drilling and fracking. To their exhaust is added the exhaust from huge generators and compressors that burn diesel or natural gas to maintain pressure in pipelines throughout all of the operations. Huge fans can be seen in some cases where compressors are located along pipelines that follow roads. You can see this along the road between Highway 133 and Colbren. And as I mentioned earlier, the exhaust, one must take into consideration a secondary effect. When natural gas, diesel, and gasoline are burned, they release nitrogen oxides along with the VOCs that when they rise into the air in the presence of sunlight, sunlight, they produce ozone, called tropospheric or ground level ozone, often visible as a blue haze and called smog. We need ozone in the stratosphere to protect us from ultraviolet light, but down here it slowly eats away at the tissue in the lungs. And unlike other organs in the body, the lungs cannot replace those damaged cells. As a result, each exposure event builds on what took place before it. Now, in order to deal with the gas that is being mined before it gets hooked to the pipeline, the practice is to burn it, called flaring. This purposeful burning of the raw gas leads to the release of all the precursors to ground level ozone. Notice that the flare in this case is almost the length of a fracking truck. These well pads, this well pad by the way is just above Highway 133 on the left going toward McClure Pass before you get to the Colburn Road. You can see it better where the pad is located here in relation to the road. You could not have seen this above you driving on the highway. Venting and flaring can last many months before the gas is finally trapped and put into the local delivery line. The primary and secondary health effects from fossil fuel, exhaust, and ozone have been well documented, ranging from premature birth, low birth weight in asthma in babies, reduced intelligence in children and adults, COPD, increased hospital admissions for upper and lower respiratory uh, problems, and heart problems, and premature death. 
At the individual level, health effects like these are easily overlooked until it is too late. Excellent research done in large urban areas with upscale universities working hand in hand with first class medical schools, physicians, and academicians through large scale epidemiological studies are proving a disturbing picture about the legacy of these chem chemicals at the population level that we have here now in the West. The third source of air pollution arises from the chemicals that are purposely introduced during drilling and fracking to facilitate the release of the gas. At TEDx, we compiled a list of products and the chemicals they contain based on what the product manufacturers revealed. We have never been able to separate out those specifically used for drilling and those for fracking. And where a product label said it was used for a particular phase, we have noted that, and you can go to our website at any time and look at this. Now this is a picture of a fracking operation that was going up on the Rhone the day we flew over. We could count 100 fracking tanks in that picture. The man-made volatiles used for fracking or drilling could escape during the chemical mixing processes for the drilling and fracking fluids, during injection while bo both drilling and fracking are going on, during flowback when the fracking fluids come back up or when water is stripped off the gas at the surface, and especially if the recovered fluids are stored in open reserve pits on the pad or until the fluids are totally disposed of. Here you see a series of fracking tanks lined up. Those hoses going into the top of the tanks carry the flow back after the frack. As each tank fills, the hoses will be switched. Plumbers and welders are kept busy at this stage, moving the pipes along from one tank to the next. These are just also, notice those lights that keep the pad as bright as daylight throughout the night. Now I've worked with men who have climbed down into those tanks, through the lids on the top, to clean them and to weld inside them. TEDx has compiled a list of 980 products on our latest list of these 421, 43%, provided less than 1% information about what is in them. And only 14% gave the full formulation. We were able to find the names of 649 chemicals in those products, but only 362 had a specific chemical name. And out of the 362 identifiable chemicals, 36% are vol volatile, many of which have adverse effects. Here you see what we call the health profiles, where we plotted the frequency of the chemicals having possible health effects for both the volatile chemicals and the water-soluble chemicals. As you can see in our analysis, there were less volatile chemicals, but they were more toxic than the water chemicals. For example, starting on the left, 95% of the chemicals cause eye, nose, skin irritation, and sensitization. These are often the first effect workers and residents complain about, as well as scratchy throat, ringing of ears, rashes, conic sinuses problems, sinus problems, dizziness, sleeplessness, and so often headaches. Then moving to the right, respiratory symptoms, asthma, sinus problems, flu-like complaints then gastrointestinal problems, because so many chemicals make people feel nauseous. Brain, central, and peripheral nervous systems show up next for 85% of the chemicals, effects that in most cases, when they persist too long, are irreversible. Then the kidney, heart, and blood, and, the, and note, the cancer drops down to 30%, but then endocrine disruption, which includes reproductive and developmental effects bounces back up to 50%. Abnormal bone development or outright death are most often associated in the other category. And then there are the effects on wildlife, especially among invertebrates who are very sensitive to low levels of exposure, those aquatic species at the bottom of our food web. Recent results from the bucketeers from various gas patches now reveal that a powerful solvent, methylene chloride, is being used to wash down the pads to remove the oily buildup on equipment. When methylene chloride first popped up in a sample 
during a routine bucket sampling, the lab immediately called to say that something was wrong. The sample had to have been contaminated. But when it kept popping up week after week in one study and in samples from a number of other studies, it was time to find out why. It has been seen stored on pads in barrels and tanks. It, has also, it is also one of those chemicals that has all 12 adverse health effects. So from the day the ground is broken to build a well pad, herbicides are used on and around the pad to control vegetation. Biocides are used to kill any bacteria that might delight in eating the oily substances that settle on the pad as the gas keeps coming up from the ground. And only in the past year were we able to confirm that chemical dispersants are being generously poured on all kinds of oily spills to make them evaporate and to disperse underground. Chemicals like these will not be reported under Colorado's fracking disclosure rule, nor will any of the drilling chemicals. Now, I show this as a reminder. This is another angle looking at the Christmas trees that I showed you earlier. And as someone said, there are already many situations across the country like this where well pads have become your neighbors. We wondered for a long time how people could possibly become ill before there was a chance for them to drink contaminated water. And as you can see from what I just presented, it is apparent that citizens' complaints could very well be real. They are not hypochondriacs. They could be exposed to all sorts of combinations and permutations of invisible airborne chemicals, and the ailments they were experiencing could be from inhalation and dermal exposure. Now, keeping in mind what I just presented about air pollution and the toxic nature of those pollutants, I want to share with you a big concern with me about how the messaging about natural gas has been hijacked. It's been taken off course. For many, the term fracking has subsumed drilling, which is an entirely different operation. What if the EPA study on fracking that is limited solely to water should come up with little or no evidence of a problem? And that could very well happen. Congress and the states could take that as a signal and let the industry move forward without full consideration of all the consequences. Right now, in the minds of many legislators, they have been told that fracking is the demon. And right now, industry is very happy with fracking being the red herring, playing right into their favor. Somehow, some way, we need to get drilling and all the other sources of pollution into the headlines along with fracking. We've got to work on the media on this. Or the government is going to miss the rest of the story. Now I want to thank our donors. And also, um, I want to put our website up. So any of you who want to go there can play around with our database, do what you want with that list of chemicals and a lot more. And thank you. <laughs>